everybody. Welcome back to Lunch with the Experts, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host. Welcome back. If you're familiar with me, welcome back. If you're not, a little bit about myself. I'm a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, storyteller, writer, and I've been working with Carcinoid Cancer Foundation for almost a decade, folks. Actually, I think it it actually has been a decade now. I keep thinking we're in 2020, but it's 2021. So 2011, I met Carson Cancer Foundation, Grace Coldstein and Keith Warner. And we created this beautiful relationship that's been uh, really impactful for my life. And I hope, and I think from your feedback, very impactful on, on uh, neuroendocrine tumor patients and, and the overall neuroendocrine tumor community. And we create video content like this live video series, but also produce video content. You can find all of it uh, under the videos tab on the Facebook page or on their YouTube channel. And uh, we're creating more and more all the time. If you are new to the show, uh, let us know where you're signing on from. We'd love to see how far these programs reach. If you're a regular, you're probably already doing that. And inevitably every week we have people from South Africa and Australia and all these places that you would think attending at this time of day on the East Coast, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, would, would not be when they would be attending because it's like 1 a.m. there, doesn't matter. They love the show and we love to have you. Um, and then by the end of, uh, of the day, we've, we've been viewed thousands and thousands of times. So we love to see how far these, this, these programs reach. It's a big, uh, big part of what fulfills me and all of us about this is the impact and the, the breadth and the depth that we're able to achieve here. Uh, so as always, we want to thank our sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. We would not be able to do this program without them. And we always like to say this disclaimer at the top of the program, the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by the audience that you all at home haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunchroom and the Experts. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information uh, provided in the presentation. And audience members, that's you, should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed the guest presenter and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any uh, choices they make about their health or treatment. So uh, we say that every week, it's a lot of words as disclaimers often are, but the takeaway is that last sentence. We're gonna give you some great advice. We're gonna hopefully answer some of your questions and give you a uh, direction along this journey. But of course, we don't know your specific case. So what we want you to do is take that information back to your home team who does know your specific case and make the best plan moving forward for you. Because as you all know, uh, this disease is very, very unique in each case is. And so uh, we're giving you general advice that you can take back to your home team and get specific with that. Uh, very excited about today's guest. Today's guest is Dr. Satya, known as Nanu Das. How are you, Dr. Das? Well, Ren, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for being here. Uh, for those at home that may not be familiar with you or your work or where you work, what you do, you know, where do you work? What do you do? And the question I always like to ask is, what is the role that that you fill, that you feel feel like you fill in this neuroendocrine tumor community? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm a GI medical oncologist uh, who focuses on drug development okay. at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. Um, I lead our uh, neuroendocrine program, but again, I'm just of one of the pieces. Um, we're thrilled to have Rob Ramirez, who joined us very recently. We have a tremendous nuclear medicine program here and my other medical oncology colleagues as well. Um, where I see myself sort of fitting in, in in the overall landscape is trying to bring forward new therapies um, for patients with neuroendocrine tumors and also specifically trying to understand where PRRT fits in the treatment landscape. How do we sequence it? Can we get better? At optimizing the patient selection for that therapy, and how do we build upon some of the success that we've seen to take it to the next level? Got it, got it. Uh, is that, is that on my end or your end? Did you hear that? Oh, <laughs> I heard something weird on my end. Uh, shout out to Dr. Ramirez, who is definitely a friend of the foundation. And I always like to make the, uh, the joke. He, he kind of seems like the Phantom of the Opera here on, on Lunch of the Experts because he's always there in the shadows watching. And every now and then he'll swoop down with like a perfect question or even an answer to some of the questions. So uh, love, love to see him. Um, uh, love to see him here at the show, and he is outstanding at what he does. And there's a sh everybody at home. There's an episode of our treatment based series that we did this past year on lung neuroendocrine tumors that we did with uh, with Dr. Ramirez and other people at the Nolan S program before he left. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about that, that's a great 
comprehensive video that talks about lung nets, which I know that you all have a lot of questions about because they tend to come up every week. Um, so before we get going, uh, a few more bits of housekeeping. Uh, go ahead and start sending your questions and inevitably we get so many that we can't get to them. So I will just say that if we don't get to your question or if you have follow-up questions, please reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation either here on their Facebook page, you can send a private message or you can reach them on their website at carcinoid.org and they, I promise you, will get, uh, get you the information you need or the person, the specialist uh, that will be able to. Um, two things I like to ask you all at the beginning of, of each program that really helps us do our job better, which is always to serve you. One, if you know somebody that would benefit from this, because the main value that I see uh, from Lunch with the Experts is the interactive, the virtual interactive session, being able to get a question across to a specialist. That's the point of it. You can always rewatch the video later, but being able to ask that question in that moment is, is so valuable. So if you know someone that would benefit from this, uh, tag them in the comments or share this video to their Facebook page and let them know that it's going on now, especially today, which we're, we started an hour behind. So people who may have thought it was going on uh, at regular time, let them know they're here. Let's get as many people as we can. And secondly, and you all have been doing such a great job of this. It really helps me out a lot. Uh, if you see a question in the sidebar that someone else has, um, you can upvote it, basically. You can like it. You can love it. There's a bunch of reactions that Facebook gives you, uh, gives you the option to use, but all of them work effectively the same for me, which is to let me know there's a demand for the question. So we get a ton of questions and comments, and as I'm filtering through them and scrolling through them, if I see one has five or seven people who have liked it, I know there's a demand for that question, and I'll make sure to get it across because, as I already said, we can never get to all the questions. So that really helps me do my job better. And finally, we always like to ask if you have downloaded CCF's net free net cancer health storylines app. This app makes it very, very easy to record your symptoms and your medications and your nutritional concerns, your moods and everything else. So check it out. If you haven't, we will put a link to that in the comments. And anything that Dr. Das refers to today, resources, articles, medicines, anything like that, we'll also put that in the comments. So uh, you can e easily access it and not have to you know, jump out uh, of your browser and go to Google and try to find it, uh, find it yourself. We'll, we'll put those links in the, um, in the comments for you. So that being said, let's get the show started, folks. All right, Dr. Das, let's talk a little bit about your work uh, as we get started with clinical trials. I know that's something that, that you spend a lot of uh, time, energy, and effort. Uh, talk to me a little bit about some of the trials that, that you've worked on and the importance. That's really what I'm, I'm trying to get at because a lot of patients have questions about this. Should I seek it out? Should I not? In what case should I seek it out? Mm -hmm. Let's talk, a, let's lay a little bit of groundwork about the, the um, you know, what's, what's so effective and important about clinical trials and then specifically some of the ones you're working on. Yeah, that's a, a fantastic question, Ryan. So, you know, clinical trials are the mechanism by which we move new drugs forward. And mm. believe it or not, many of the approved drugs all once started as a new drug. And particularly in the neuroendocrine tumor field, we've had a renaissance of drugs that have been approved. Actually, in the last 10 years, you know, we've had five to six FDA approvals for new drugs. And the way those moved forward were through clinical trials. So while existing things are, are good and building upon some of the things we had, we can always do better. So one of the major focuses in neuroendocrine tumor studies is actually finding drugs and agents that can improve tumor cytoreduction or tumor shrinkage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as you guys know, you know, we don't have that many agents that can shrink tumors effectively. Uh, PRT may be one of them in certain instances for patients with, for example, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Capecitabine and temozolomide is an active shrinking therapy. But outside of therapies such as that, we don't have a lot of, of, of treatments that can kind of shrink, shrink uh, treatments. Um, I think the other focus is, is that we have a number of agents that are similar. So for example, the thing that I can think about are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So uh, we know that for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, sunitinib uh, is a drug that's oftentimes used, but there's a whole bunch of new tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are coming. Um, you know, some of these include things like cabozantinib, which is actually being studied in the cabinet study. Uh, lenvatinib, which was studied in a, a European study called the TALENT trial, and that was really uh, recently presented, and surafatinib, which is a new kid on the block, but which studied in China first, but is actually being studied by some of our colleagues at MD Anderson. And, and the big question is, how do we know which drug is better or more tolerable? And, and I think the way to achieve that is through things like clinical trials. So, you know, they are, uh, there's no better way to test something um, outside of a clinical trial. 
um, because that way we truly can compare it to a prior treatment standard. So with that end, some of the, the clinical trials that I'm interested in are really actually um, focusing on actually two different types of neuroendocrine tumors. You know, we know that neuroendocrine carcinomas, for example, are not the same as, as well-differentiated nets. And patients with each of these diseases have very different treatment options and treatment landscapes. So the studies, um, for example, starting with the neuroendocrine carcinoma space that I've been working on, um, are looking at combinatorial immunotherapy, uh, as well as agents that improve DNA damage repair uh, of chemotherapy. So the immunotherapy uh, study that we're currently looking at is a, a combination study of um, cabozantinib, which is one of those newer tyrosine kinase inhibitors, plus the checkpoint inhibitors nivolumab and ipilimumab. So we know that there are certain signals that checkpoint inhibitors may be active in patients with higher grade or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, but we don't quite know what that niche is. So this study that's being sponsored by the NCI aims to answer that question and also ask whether cabozantinib can further unlock the potential of those drugs. Um, one of the other studies in neuroendocrine carcinoma that um, I'm privileged to be involved with is actually a combination of chemotherapy plus um, a class of DNA damage repair inhibitors. So the chemotherapy agents here are, are topotecan or irinotecan, and those are being combined with the DNA damage repair inhibitor uh, called an ATR inhibitor. And we believe that the combination of those two drugs can cause more damage, particularly in more rapidly dividing cells, such as poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma and small cell lung cancer. Um, so those are some of the neuroendocrine carcinoma studies we also are looking at some uh, trials in well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. So some of these are in development, but, um, but we have a study looking at cabozantinib again in combination with the energy-starving drug called CB839. And we're looking to see if that can improve tumor shrinkage in pancreatic and actually lung net patients. Um, and we also have a proposal of looking at PRT, whether we can actually remove bigger tumors to make PRT more effective. So, sorry, long answer, but these are a few of the trials. No, I mean, working on. I, I know you're doing a, a lot of work in that in that field. Um, and I also saw that recently you were chosen for the Vanderbilt uh, Ingram Cancer Center uh, Ambassadors Fund. Is that for that, uh, that that latter trial that you just mentioned? That's exactly right, Ren. Yeah. So, so we're yeah. yeah. Explain to me what that is, but more importantly, what's what opportunity does the Ambassadors Fund provide for you? Yeah, so so but some, so this pertains to that study of actually removing bulkier tumors prior to PRT in patients with gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors. And what we're specifically looking to achieve with the Ambassadors Fund is actually getting dotatate scans for patients after surgery. So mm -hmm. most patients that are being considered for PRT get a pre uh, pre-treatment gallium dotatate PET to make sure that the tumor expresses the receptors, there's enough expression to make sure that PRT is the right option. But no one's actually ever looked at how these tumors change after surgery or removing a bulky tumor. So this ambassador's fund is going to pay for gallium dotatate pets for um, a number of patients on the study, um, which will be, you know, uh, have, have some really fantastic insights for us to learn how somatostatin receptor expression changes. Got it. Awesome. Well, congrats on, on being selected for that, by the way. Um, all right. Well, as always, we have lots of questions already pouring in, and so I want to make sure we start getting to some of them. But uh, in reference to uh, my point earlier about people all over the world, shout out to Thomas or Tomas from Stockholm, Sweden, Sweden joining us, hitting up Scandinavia already. Uh, I have a question from Donna, uh, Dr. Das, uh, about PRT, so it's relevant to what we were, we were just talking about. And this actually has been coming up a lot lately. So Donna says, I finished with my fourth PRT three weeks ago. I've had joint pain along with some referred and nerve pain for several months. And I don't know what to do if this is related to NETS or PRRT or both or neither. Do you hear of this problem with your PRRT patients? And if so, any suggestions? Yeah, Donna, it's a really good question. Um, and, you know, joint pains are something that we are seeing increasingly, but actually more in the context of, of patients using a somatostatin analog. So I'm not sure, uh, Donna, whether you're continuing on a somatostatin analog. But sometimes over time, uh, that can actually accumulate uh, to, to causing joint pains. We don't traditionally think of PRT by itself causing joint pains, but what we do see is that for sometimes patients who have tumors in the bone um, that get affected with PRT, and even when it's working, 
you can actually see bone aches and occasional myalgias. So um, I think, you know, it may be perhaps more related to the somatostatin analog, if that's what you're on, or if uh, you do have some bone tumors present, uh, we do sometimes see that. Um, oftentimes, a good strategy is just um, actually good old, uh, good old fashioned over the counter um, uh, insects or ibuprofen and things like that, which can be quite effective uh, for, for bone aches. Yeah, and Donna, thanks again for your, for your question. Uh, that is something we've been hearing a lot here on the show. And as Dr. Da said, that that seems to be, you know, where all our specialists are landing with the somatostatin analog, as well as the other community members that have experienced that. So feel free to chat with people in the, in the comments section, because I think I you are not the only one. There's a lot of people experiencing that. So thank you so much for your question. Another PRT question from AG Dabs, top fan of the foundation. Uh, Dr. Das's concerns for PRRT patients with extensive abdominal metastasis. AJ, fantastic question. So, um, you know, this is a, a big area of debate, right, is that the concern with PRT is that potentially you can actually get a flare uh, before you get shrinkage. So sometimes if patients have a lot of disease in the abdomen and you have a mild, uh, a, even a mild flare, that can cause some complications like uh, elevation of liver enzymes or potentially even a small bowel obstruction or um, temporarily blocking off blood flow to, uh, to an organ like the bowel. So these are things that we are highly concerned about, actually. Um, and, and while there's not a, a lot of published data out there, um, we and other centers, um, so what we do is that every patient that is uh, considered for PRT, we discuss in our neuroendocrine tumor board. Um, and so particularly folks with higher risk disease, we've actually been starting to use steroids. So we've been using a short course of steroids uh, before PRT, um, the day of PRT and three days after, and the steroid we use is dexamethasone, um, four milligrams twice a day. And fortunately, thus far, we ha actually have not experienced um, any patients who've encountered bowel obstructions or mesenteric kind of inflammation, um, despite having a higher volume of disease. Um, but it's certainly a consideration um, for how we should dose patients, and perhaps do we need to give steroids to certain patients to prevent complications. Got it. Thank you. And thank you for your question. Um, next question, un, not related to PRT, but uh, still topical. And we have a lot of questions about the vaccine mm -hmm. uh, from net patients. So Karen says, I heard for a net patient that doctor, a doctor should administer the COVID-19 vaccine in case uh, we develop carcinoid crisis. Have you heard of that? Is that true? Is that accurate? Yeah, that's a, again, great question. Now, I have not heard of that. Um, however, Karen, it's not, you know, I think it really depends on sort of the extent of syndrome. Um, you know, we think of uh, aspects like surgery or major interventions causing things like carcinoid crisis and carcinoid storm. Um, in my experience, all the net patients that have gotten the COVID vaccine have been able to get it uh, you know, at a, at a regular vaccine center. And so you know, naturally, you know, we want to make sure that there are medical professionals available, uh, and there are, um, but I don't think a doctor needs to specifically administer uh, the vaccine for it to be safely given. Awesome. Thank you. Next question from John, also a top fan of the foundation. Hello, my question, is it normal for blood sugars to fluctuate when taking 28-day lanreotide? My wife, uh, Lorraine, has had her second month uh, injection and sugars have raised. And a few other people have, the, uh, few other people have this question as well. John, uh, that, uh, that's, uh, thanks for your question. So absolutely. So one of the mechanisms of action of the somatostatin analogs, whether that's octreotide or lanreotide, um, can actually cause hyperglycemia or blood sugars to rise. Now, usually over time, the blood sugars can, can level out. Um, however, you know, if, if patients are, are, are diabetic or have higher blood sugars to begin with, it's certainly something that we oftentimes work with uh, primary care doctors to perhaps titrate, um, you know, a, a diabetic regimen. Um, but that is absolutely common. Uh, we, we oftentimes just see blood sugars rise. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, Dr. Das, I have a question. Now, let's lay a little bit of groundwork here. Now, uh, when I talked to you, you know, earlier this week, uh, I talked about our, the, the, the friends of the foundation, the people who attend these shows, and the patients of this disease, I think in general, very, very well educated and do their due diligence for sure, I, I've noticed. But also we have a lot of people that are early in their diagnosis or their journey with NETS. And so I always like to make sure that we're 
establishing that kind that kind of foundation. So we have a question from Dorothy, and Dorothy says, at the risk of sounding uneducated about all this, listen, Dorothy, I am a full believer in that. You know, there are no dumb questions. This is this is your disease. This is your life. These are the questions you need to ask. So I want to make sure that we get this. And thank you for for asking this. Um, and so she just wants uh, a little bit more of an explanation or elaboration on what, what we specifically mean when we say well differentiated and poorly differentiated and what that what that effectively means. Yeah, Dorothy, thanks for your question. You know, this is actually a question that we as a field, um, you know, for 30 or 40 years have struggled with, but it's actually perhaps the most important question that you can ask your doctor when you get a diagnosis of a neuroendocrine tumor. So what differentiation means, Dorothy, is that when you actually look under the microscope, how similar uh, the tumor cells look to the organ in which the tumor started. So for example, if it's a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, how similar do those cells look to the actual pancreas? Um, and well-differentiated tumors um, keep their morphology, meaning they look very similar to the organ in which they started. Um, they have a very um, classic uh, way they look, uh, whereas poorly differentiated tumors look bizarre. So they look nothing like the tumor, uh, excuse me, nothing like the organ in which they started and also lose the features that normal neuroendocrine cells have. Um, and so that is an incredibly important distinction and one that um, you know, a, a pathologist sh should comment upon uh, when reviewing a biopsy. Um, upon making the diagnosis. Awesome, thank you for that. Thanks, Dorothy. Those questions are are honestly like some of the best because if we don't understand those uh, those fundamental issues, then like Dr. Da said, I mean that's that that creates problems all, all along the line. So let's ask those important questions first, yes, sir. And sorry, Rand, if I may, I was just going to say that you know for 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 decades. Um, before we knew the difference in, in differentiation, we used to group well-differentiated and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors together in trials. And that's why sometimes drugs would fail because they might be very active in one, but aren't in the other. And there's, there, are, there are two different tumor types. So actually, you know, by including them together is a, is a mistake that, that we as a field have now learned from, fortunately. So. Got it, got it, thank you. Uh, next question from Barney. Barney says, hello, Dr. Doss. When a person has tumor secreting ACTH for decades, will their immune system ever recover? And if so, how long does that recovery typically take? Yeah, Barney, thanks for your question. So, um, you know, we know that, you know, neuroendoc so ACTH, for example, is a, is a rare uh, hormone that's, that's released by neuroendocrine tumors. You know, most commonly we think of small bowel neuroendocrine tumors uh, secreting serotonin. Um, and we think of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors when they do secrete things, secreting things like uh, VIP, uh, rarely insulin, glucagon, um, or others. And so, you know, it, it depends a little bit on where, where uh, your tumor started, but also the degree of, of treatment. Um, you know, we know that ACTH can cause um, sort of cortisol uh, overproduction. And cortisol over a long period of time can cause the immune system to be suppressed. So my suspicion um, is that when the tumor, or hopefully with, with the tumor being controlled with the, with the treatments, that should lower the, the overall burden of the ACTH uh, and thereby reduce the cortisol levels and, and hopefully cause the immune system to, to bounce back. Um, now, it can take a long time if, if someone has had an ACTH secreting tumor for, for years or decades. Um, you know, the immune system may never fully come back, but I think the importance is reducing those levels with tumor control, um, which hopefully will allow uh, the immune system to recover in some way. Got it. Thank you. So Jennifer says, I've had four sessions uh, of Lutathera, which resulted in lower white slash red cells, but was quite successful overall. You mentioned earlier about damage repair technology. Can you elaborate or is this even applicable? Yeah, Jennifer, so um, so I think it's two, two questions and we'll, we'll get to each one. So the, mm -hmm. the first, what you're describing, Jennifer, is sort of some of the, the common effects of uh, the uh, PRT, Lutathera being the FDA approved type of PRT <laughs> um, on our bone marrow cells. So uh, we actually know that PRT can affect red cells, uh, white cells. Actually, most commonly it affects platelets. Um, but that can normalize. Usually it takes about 
uh, three to four months for, for blood count levels to normalize. So I'm hopeful that they should bounce back. Um, the second question, Jennifer, actually what I was referring to earlier is a, is a little bit different. So um, I was talking about drugs that when combined with PRT or with other treatments can actually increase the damage to neuroendocrine cells. Now, as you alluded to, PRT alone has some side effects. So we have to make sure that when we're adding agents to PRT, they have to be safe so that we want them to damage this, the cancer cells, but we don't want them to damage our bone marrow. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, easy question, hopefully, from, uh, from our friend AG. Does Vanderbilt have this, the Copper 64 scan available yet? Yeah, my friend, we do, we do actually. Um, we actually uh, started uh, allowing the Copper Dotatate scans about a month ago. So we have both Gallium and the Copper scans now. And, and um, let's talk a little bit about what that is and what, what uh, what it does, what, why it's uh, why it has value. Yeah, so so the dotatate um, scans are, are incredibly important, particularly when we're thinking about starting a therapy or when you know your disease has first been diagnosed and we're trying to stage it. Um, and the reason is as follows: so these dotatate scans are fancy types of PET scans, but a normal PET scan uses a sugar called FDG, which actually binds to glucose. Um, but this dotatate PET scan binds to somatostatin receptor. So about 90% of well-differentiated or lower-grade neuroendocrine tumors express a protein on their surface called somatostatin. So the dotatate is a targeted means of actually imaging neuroendocrine tumors. And it's actually the most sensitive scan we have. So um, it, sometimes it can pick up disease that weren't normally seen on a CT scan or an MRI. Now, the caveat to remember though, is that these dotatate scans are more applicable for patients with lower grade tumors. When we're talking about neuroendocrine carcinomas, those tumors unfortunately lose somatostatin and therefore actually are not positive on a, on a dotatate scan. Um, the, the second point, Rain, why the copper I think is an important addition um, you know, there's no difference. We don't believe there's any difference in terms of the sensitivity of the scans. They're both phenomenal. But where copper may have an advantage is that it has a longer half-life. So, you know, God forbid you get a flat tire on your way to get your scan. The tracer doesn't disappear. In gallium, that half-life is only about an hour, an hour and a half. Copper is about 13 hours. Um, and secondly, we don't need a generator to, to make the copper dotatate tracer, whereas you do for gallium. So you can order a lot more scans rather than be limited by the um, gallium amount to get scans. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, if you are just joining us or joined us late, this is Lunch with the Experts, the Carcinoma Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. Today, our guest is Dr. Nanu Das from Vanderbilt. We're having a, a good time already, and it, these shows always seem to move by so quickly. We are halfway done, so we're going to keep plugging forward. I see a few of you, too, and this is always very helpful. You, uh, if, you, if you're if you getting value, if you're getting the answers that you need, uh, I just saw a flood of, of the like emojis, which is the thumbs up on Facebook. So if, uh, if you're getting the information that you need, that's an easy way to visually let us know that we're doing our job. You can just send those little likes or loves or any of the reactions that you want to do. But welcome to the show. If you came late, go ahead and send in your questions. We're going to keep plugging along and answering some of your questions. Next question comes from Nancy, and Nancy says, what are the long-range um, pros and cons of a cholecystectomy? Uh, <laughs> Say that word for me so I don't butcher it again. You did pretty good. Cholecystectomy. Cholecystectomy. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. During net liver METS uh, debunking, sandostatin is already is compromising digestion and absorption, and I'm worried about adding uh, adding to that by removing my gallbladder, which so far has never been abnormal. Yeah, Nancy. I mean, I think that's a, a really um, thanks for your question, and it's a, it's a valid point. But you know what I'll tell you is that. Um, a lot of times, actually, uh, when patients are diagnosed with a, a neuroendocrine tumor that's not surgically removable and um, folks are being considered for a somatostatin analog, um, the gallbladder is actually removed uh, sort of prophylactically or up front. Um, and the reason is that long-term use of the somatostatin analogs, one of the side effects is gallstones. So over time, sometimes gallstones can deliver, and that's why surgeons sometimes just take out the gallbladder. 
Um, you're right that it can uh, it can sometimes cause diarrhea. You know, I, I think we're still learning as a field who is more susceptible to diarrhea from their gallbladders being removed. Um, but if that is um, uh, you know something that occurs after that, um, it's something that we we have we have agents like uh, things like cholestyramine, uh, which actually absorb bile salts and help reduce the burden of diarrhea. Um, but my feeling is that, you know, it is safe to get a cholecystectomy, um, you know, particularly either up front or during the course of other therapies because some of the long-term complications with regards to gallstones uh, from some metastatic analogs. Got it, got it. Thanks, Nancy. Cholecystectomy. Mm -hmm. See, folks, uh, lunch with the experts. I, I am not the expert. <laughs> so I also get to learn at this show, and this is why I love my job. Um, next question from Sharon. I've actually, we've been hearing this, this question or a version of this question frequently. Sharon says, is there any research on treatments for net patients who do not express receptors? Uh, and also let's maybe establish like what, what she's meaning when she says that, what kind of receptors? Yeah, Sharon, thanks for your question. I mean, this is a, a huge area of need in the field. So the receptors that Sharon is referring to here are somatostatin. And so as we just talked about, you know, uh, you know, not fortunately, about 90% of patients with low-grade neuroendocrine tumors have receptor or express somatostatin, but that still leaves a chunk of patients who don't have the receptor. Um, and that's relevant because if you don't have the receptor, that's and the way we look at that is through these dotatate scans. But if you don't have a receptor, then you don't quite have the target for, for treatments like somatostatin analogs or PRRT. And so that is a, a huge question is that, you know, I think as a field, we do recognize that we need to improve our drug development efforts for patients that don't express somatostatin. And there's some really interesting work being done on the, like the basic science side of looking that, can we actually induce somatostatin receptor expression on neuroendocrine cells that don't previously express it so that patients could be candidates for things like PRRT. Um, but right now, it, it, it is a, um, a big gap in the field. Um, but, but I will tell you, though, is that you know, patients that don't express receptor uh, definitely still have options, depending on where the primary tumor started. So for example, um, in patients with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, uh, we can still treat patients with everolimus. We can still treat patients with sunitinib. We can still treat patients with capecitabine and timozolamide. Um, we still have clinical trials. Um, where it does become a challenge is for patients with small bowel or mid-gut nets, uh, because outside of everolimus, um, you know, they're not really approved therapies for patients without receptor expression. So something that we need to work on, absolutely. Got it, got it. Um, question from Marge says, would, would lanreotide cause rib pain? I, I do have metastases to my rib, so it could possibly be that, but is could it potentially be the lanreotide, or is it, or is it most likely the the, the neuroendocrine tumor? Yeah, Marge, I mean, that's a, a really good question. I think some of that, the answer to that depends on when the onset of the rib pain was. You know, mm. if the if the tumors and, and the ribs have been there for a while, um, less likely that they would be the contributing cause to the pain. Um, whereas if you started the lanreotide more recently or, ha or have been in, on it for a period of time, that certainly can do it. You know, I think joint aches are honestly, and, and Rain, you alluded to this, one of kind of the understated side effects. Uh, I think it's one of the things now I'm, I'm starting to bring up to all my patients, um, just because it is something that we see quite commonly. Um, so I think tempo of when it started um, would help us determine where the rib pain is, um, is coming from. Yeah, yeah, great, <laughs> great point. Um, next question from Nicole from the Netherlands. Hello, Nicole. In my opinion, there seems to be more trials for functional nets and less option for non-functional nets. Is that accurate or am I wrong here? So, so thanks for your question, Nicole. Um, so, you know, I, I'll tell you this. I, I think um, certainly she, you are correct originally. Um, actually, you know, octreotide, uh, which was, you know, one of the first FDA approved drugs for neuroendocrine tumors, was tested in patients with functional uh, mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. And so certainly one of those, uh, you know, the original trials were mainly focusing on functional neuroendocrine tumors. I can say in the more recent studies that are being developed or are currently enrolling, um, you know, functionality is, is not as commonly mentioned. So um, it actually, many of these trials enroll both functional and non-functional tumors. Mm -hmm. So I think we're moving away from um, including functionality as a restriction to enrollment. 
um, for most of our therapeutic or drug drug associated trials. Good to know. Thank you for your question. Um, folks, if you're, if you're just joining us or joining us late, this is the Carson on Cancer Foundation's Luncheon with the Experts. And I just want to reiterate that if you don't get your question answered or if you have follow-up questions, to reach out to Carson on Cancer Foundation, either here on their Facebook page or at carsonoid.org. And also know that these videos will be evergreen. They'll live here on the Facebook uh, page of Carson on Cancer Foundation. You just go to the videos tab or the videos section. And also starting Monday, we will republish them to YouTube for those who don't have Facebook. You can access them there. There's a whole library, so you can always refer back to these. And I have a, a, a comment from John. It says, we have found a lot of our answers or some of our answers on YouTube. They have several of Rain shows on there. It's very helpful for patients, well, new patients of carcinoid syndrome. Rain is a great ambassador and has wonderful guests. We find this luncheon uh, helpful. Well, John, that's what we're here to do. And I just want to make note that, uh, you know, I, I appreciate what you say about me. I give all credit to Carson and Cancer Foundation for, and I was talking to Dr. Doss about this earlier, for really being on the forefront of new media and, and serving their audience. And they've been doing this for, for decades, you know, doing blogs when it was the early days of blogs, doing videos when people were just starting to do videos. I've worked with them with over a decade. And so I'm very grateful to have the opportunity uh, and be a host of this show. Uh, but the engine that drives it forward is always the foundation. And so I give all props to them, but I'm so glad that you're getting help because that is why I'm here. And that's why the foundation is here. So that tells me we're doing our job. Um, let's see, next question from Chandler. Chandler says, would a low-grade neuroendocrine tumor that surrounds mesenteric arteries be likely to eventually disrupt uh, blood supply to the GI tract? Yeah, Chandler, thanks for that question. Um, it's definitely something that we um, actually are, uh, we, we definitely worry about because one of the things that we note when patients have uh, tumors in the mesentery is one of the first questions actually I always ask my radiologist is, you know, how do the vessels look? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes even for patients with a tumor that hasn't spread elsewhere, but is just located in the mesentery around a vessel, I will start treatment for that very reason to, to avoid uh, potential compromise. So just because a tumor is there in the mesentery doesn't mean it will compromise the blood vessels, but if it's close um, uh, and it's not treated, it certainly could. Um, so, you know, those are the things that um, you know, your oncologist um, and should definitely be, be thinking about um, if, if tumors are located in that area. Got it. Right. Um, AG asked if you could elaborate on which specialists are included in the tumor board at Vanderbilt. And we often talk about the importance of multidisciplinary teams and tumor boards. So at Vanderbilt, what, what is the group of specialists that you have there on your board? Absolutely, AG. So our uh, nuclear medicine tumor board is comprised of the following uh, folks. We have nuclear medicine doctors um, who oftentimes interpret our dotatate pets. Uh, we have traditional radiologists. Uh, we have all sh our surgical oncology colleagues. Um, we have interventional radiology. Um, Dan Brown is, is our kind of um, interventional radiologist du jour. Um, who often joins us. Um, occasionally, um, not always, but we have our radiation oncology colleagues, uh, and then certainly uh, the medical oncologists. So um, many uh, in our gastrointestinal uh, oncology group um, and some in our thoracic oncology group as well. Anybody that you would uh, add to that uh, list if you could? Yeah, I think, um, I think uh, actually uh, dietitians, uh, believe it or not. You know, I think, oh, yeah. Uh, I think yeah, many folks it's something that um, oftentimes as cancer docs, we don't have enough time to spend with our patients. Um, but we do now have a, actually a, a dietitian who's part of our clinic, um, but would love to actually have them part of our, our tumor board as well to actually talk about which patients may be at, at risk uh, for nutritional compromise or some of the other facets we should be thinking about uh, outside of just tumor size and treatments. Absolutely, no, I think that's a totally fair point. Um, Okay, next question from Lisa. I'm a lung net patient with a, uh, with a resection one year ago, and I have a tumor in the other lung that's inoperable. So, so far, no additional growth next scan on Monday, along with uh, blood draw, uh, so fingers crossed. So the question is, how common or uncommon is it to have additional areas of the body to have metastases if it is typical neuroendocrine, they consider stage four because it's in both lungs? So, yeah, so it's a great question. So I think, you know, so this is a little bit nuanced because, so it could be that, you know, the primary tumor 
has gone to the other lung, which in case, you know, would make it stage four as you had originally defined. But sometimes neuroendocrine tumors can actually occur, more than one can occur. So it could be a, a separate potential lung primary too, uh, as well, that's just occurred in the other lung. So neuroendocrine tumors are, are funny tumors, even the low grade tumors, which are in this case, the typical uh, lung nets, they can recur. So it's not, um, uh, you know, uh, not unusual, but I will say is that your pattern of recurrence is unusual because usually when neuroendocrine tumors recur, they usually occur in other body sites, not necessarily the same organ site. All right. Um, question from Amanda it says, is it possible to have a high growth rate and a well-differentiated tumor? Yeah, Amanda, so, so that's, that's the really, um, it's a terrific question. And that's really the reason why your oncologists get kind of the, the routine surveillance scans, even when your tumor hasn't changed in some time. You know, I have seen in, in several patients that, you know, a neuroendocrine tumor can be dormant for years, and then at some period of time can pick up growth. And so uh, it is absolutely important to, to, to measure that. And just because a neuroendocrine tumor originally didn't grow or wasn't growing quickly, doesn't mean it can't down the road. So yes, even low grade tumors sometimes can pick up steam. Um, and sometimes that's our motivation for, uh, for, for switching to a more potent therapy and making a, a change. And a follow-up question from, uh, from Amanda, is norepinephrine a common hormone caused by NETS? Amanda, not, not as commonly. So norepinephrine and epinephrine, so it can be caused by certain types uh, of neuroendocrine tumors, but they are rare. They are the adrenal tumors, typically um, uh, adrenal tumors such as pheochromocytomas um, can uh, produce some of those hormones. Um, but again, those are much rarer even in the net, uh, neuroendocrine tumor landscape. Got it. Moving right along, folks, we have just shy of 20 minutes to today's episode of Lunch with the Experts with Dr. Das. Candace says, I took my daughter to the ER Monday, and the doctor, th th this happens uh, frequently, it seems, or at least often. I took my daughter to the ER uh, Monday, and the doctor saw her, said that this is not cancer. She had a lower left lobe of the lung removed and has places on lymph nodes. Is this considered a cancer? So, Candace, I think that's a it's a great question, one that's sort of been been debated. But but a neuroendocrine tumor is absolutely cancer because it can grow like a cancer, it can spread like a cancer, and it has the characteristics of any other cancer. Though, as we've talked about a little bit here, the growth rates for the lower grade tumor types can be much slower. Um, in my estimation, it absolutely is a is a cancer. And and. What, what's the other side of that? I mean, why why is that debated? Why do some doctors, and I know that's kind of changing, I think it was more historically, it wasn't regarded as a cancer, but just so people understand the full picture, why uh, have has everybody been slow to to uh, adapt that that perspective? Yeah, right, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a historical question. So yeah. actually the, one of the first uh, pathologists in uh, Siegfried Oberndorfer, uh, when he actually, he was the first to actually look at nets under the microscope. So he actually called them carcinoidy or cancer-like. And actually his hypothesis originally was that they were benign. He didn't, he, he, he noted a lot of these tumors on small bowel resection specimens or appendiceal uh, or appendixes that were removed for other reasons. But interestingly enough, 10 years later, he actually made an amendment to his own statement because he found that these tumors could change and could metastasize. And so he thought of them in that instance as being malignant or having potential to spread. So I think a lot of that notion actually starts from way back when neuroendocrine tumors were first discovered. Um, but I think we as a field are now moving toward the fact that these are absolutely cancers and, and, and can behave as such. Absolutely, thank you for, for elaborating there. Uh, another question from Amanda. Amanda says, when I was 23, I had a 2.2 centimeter carcinoid at the tip of my appendix. Um, that was found accidentally. And I'm sure you know this happened, that happens frequently. Uh, later, about eight years later, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I feel like there's more focus on the breast cancer than the carcinoid with my oncologist. Another is mm -hmm. a cancer question, it seems. Uh, what tests should I request from my doctor to be monitoring for carcinoid uh, or neuroendocrine tumors? 
Yeah, so you know, this is a, a, a good question and one that we still are honestly fleshing out with appendiceal tumors because, you know, really with um, tumors that start in the appendix, you know, a tumor that's less than two centimeters that doesn't penetrate, we think about it having incredibly low chance of recurrence. Hmm. But, you know, your tumor being greater than two centimeters, there certainly is a chance for a late recurrence. Um, and, you know, I, I think what, what I would recommend is um, the neuroendocrine tumors are a little different from other tumors. They can come back after five years. You know, with other cancers, we think about removing them and maybe after five years, even throwing around the word cure. Um, but for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, you know, we think about that at minimum of a 10-year period. So I would still recommend an annual CT scan of the abdomen just to make sure um, but outside of that, I, I, I don't think I would do um, anything else um, to, to, to surveil the appendiceal neuroendocrine tumor. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Jenny says, I have neuroendocrine tumor and have been diagnosed with moderate hypertension. What treatment is best to treat this and what actually causes it? Yeah, so, so Jenny, um, it's a, a, a great question and a, and a nuanced one because um, sometimes, you know, so some, uh, so some neuroendocrine tumors, we typically think of small bowel or other gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors that are functional, that can produce serotonin. Um, you know, we think about classically carcinoid syndrome, but blood pressure elevations can be seen in that instance. But um, in order to truly assess whether your tumor is responsible, um, you know, we, we would have to know whether it's functional. Is it actually producing hormone? Um, and, and does that actually get better if you have been treated or are actively ongoing treatment? Now, sometimes just hypertension as we all get older can also develop independently of the neuroendocrine tumor. So I think kind of distinguishing those two aspects would be um, important. But regardless, um, if the hypertension is at a level, you know, typically we think about, you know, let's say more than 140 systolic, uh, working with your primary doctor to be on an antihypertensive medication, I think, is 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 a good idea, regardless of what caused it. So we talked today a lot about functional and non-functional. Michelle has a question: How do you know if you have a functional or non-functional PNET? Yeah, so Michelle, uh, PNETs uh, tend to be much more rarely functional, but that doesn't mean they can't happen. So we think about functionality as both a combination of your clinical symptoms as well as having a hormone level present. Honestly, there's a huge amount of controversy. There are patients now that when we check hormones, folks have no symptoms from their elevation of hormone, but could have elevated hormone. And we still don't know whether to truly classify those folks as functional or not. But in the case of, um, of what you're describing, uh, typically we, we would wanna see certain symptoms. So uh, let's say for a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, um, you know, VIP is a level that though rare can be produced. So that causes watery diarrhea, can cause potassium to be low. Um, one of the other hormones that's commonly produced is glucagon. So glucagon can cause uh, really high blood sugar levels, can cause a rash that kind of spreads. And it's different from a flushing rash, which sort of disappears. This is a rash that kind of stays and, and can spread through different parts. Um, so really it depends on kind of the symptoms you're having to define whether a tumor is functional. Got it, thank you. And, and thanks for your question, Michelle. Uh, another debated question. There's a lot, there's always a lot of, not controversies, but a lot of yeah. debates, you know, because this is an ongoing field. We're learning a lot about it every day, every week, every month. And so Rosa says, I have two typical carcinoid tumors in my lungs and recently went to Duke University. Shout out to Duke. I'm just a couple of miles away. Uh, me. <laughs> to see a net doctor and a cardiothoracic surgeon. But many people tell me that I must see a lung net specialist. Is this true? And I know with lung nets, we've always kind of, you know, had this debate. Is, is it a neuroendocrine tumor? Or is it a lung cancer? Mm -hmm. So uh, she went to see a net doctor and a cardiothoracic surgeon, but many tell her she needs to see a lung net specialist. Is this true? You know, I think it, I think if, um, if you've seen a net, um, a net specialist, I think that suffices because, you know, may, uh, while some like Dr. Ramirez, you know, focus um, on, on lung nets as a, an area of his specific expertise, I think for the most part, many uh, neuroendocrine oncologists see uh, patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors as well. So I think as long as you've seen a net doctor in addition to uh, the surgeon, I think that should, that should suffice because they could provide you the input 
um, you know, towards making the right decisions. And I think here, naturally, surgery is being discussed. Um, but I, but I, but I think that should be sufficient. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds like it, it makes sense. As I know, a lot of we still have. I talk to Dr. Ramirez about this all the time. We still mm -hmm. have a. a <laughs> kind of a dual approach to those because it's not really a lung cancer. It's not, you know, it is a mm -hmm. net, but it's, you know, it's this kind of unique, they're all unique, but lung nets I find to be especially so. Uh, Karen says, how do we prepare for a chromogranin A blood test? Are there any foods that I should avoid? Yeah, so Karen, great question. And I'll tell you, um, full disclosure, I actually don't use a chromogranin A because of all the, uh, the reasons that it can be falsely elevated. You know, the, the big things, um, Karen, that we usually recommend, the, the big factors that can raise a chromogranin uh, falsely are, are medications like um, anti-acid medications. So things like omeprazole, uh, Prilosec, those are medications that can cause a chromogranin level to be falsely elevated. Um, so really, uh, if you can, if you are on an anti-acid medication to try to pause from that um, before getting a chromogranin would be, would be, um, would be the recommendation that, that I could make. Got it. Uh, I've got an interesting question from Amir here, and it seems like a couple other people. Is there any conflict between sandostatin LAR and some anti-stress medicines like Zoloft or something like that, which increase the level of, of serotonin? Mm -hmm. Mayor, fantastic question. And actually, so, um, you know, this was a study that was actually, it was a retrospective study done at Memorial a few years back, maybe now 10 years back, but actually showed that, um, you know, drugs like SSRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Zoloft, have no uh, bearing on worsening um, carcinoid syndrome symptoms. And the reason being is that SS, uh, SSRI, the psychiatric medications, actually act on the neuronal synapse. So it's just inside the brain. Whereas we think about systemic effects of serotonin uh, being more causative or implicative in neuroendocrine tumors. So it should not um, actually worsen mood um, being on an, uh, or rather, excuse me, worsen tumor status by being on an SSRI. God. Uh, folks, we have just shy of 10 minutes left, so I'm going to keep moving forward with your questions. You've had some great ones today. Jim says, besides being uh, stage four nets, I'm, I also have stage four chronic kidney disease. How does the kidney issue possibly affect the net treatment in the future? Yeah, Jim, that's a, um, a really good question. Um, usually where we think about kidney disease um, limiting neuroendocrine tumor treatments is in the setting of PRRT. So, you know, we know that PRRT is actually a treatment that's cleared by the kidneys. And so it's not, as, it's not as though PRRT giving it will damage kidneys because the rates of actual kidney damage from PRRT are incredibly rare. But it's more that the PRRT can hang around in your bloodstream and cause blood count abnormalities and persistence of those aspects. So um, it really depends on the extent of kidney disease, Jim, but I think we're now being, becoming more comfortable treating patients with kidney disease with PRT. Sometimes what we do is we modify the dose. So for example, we'll do half dose for patients with more significant kidney disease to make sure the drug is tolerable. So PRT is the one treatment that I can see could be directly affected, but hopefully as we're now um, as a field are learning more about it, um, that wouldn't be a, a factor that wouldn't allow you to be considered for it. All right, thank you. Jesse has a question about uh, carcinoid syndrome. What hormones, we always hear about serotonin, what hormones cause carcinoid syndrome? Is it just serotonin or can any hormone uh, be the cause or what other hormones could potentially be the cause? Yeah, Jesse, that's a, thanks for your question. Um, so classically, serotonin is the big driver of carcinoid syndrome, but there can be other hormones. So for example, uh, there's a phenomenon called atypical carcinoid syndrome, which is uh, produced by patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors, and that can cause uh, that can be driven by histamine. So histamine can also be implicated. Now the big thing is that we do realize there's other hormones beyond serotonin that cause some of the downstream effects. You know, as as we uh, as we know, uh, you know, prolonged serotonin or carcinoid syndrome increases the risk of actually having a leaky heart valve or carcinoid heart disease. And so, you know, there are other hormones, things like uh, transforming growth factor beta um, or other fibroblasts sort of eliciting hormones that are triggered. But we do think that serotonin is the big player um, in carcinoid syndrome. Got it. I've also had a lot of questions here about appendix 
uh, net nets found on the appendix. And so I've got one here from Sandy that says, what is the difference or, you know, is there a difference between a net found on the appendix and an append, uh, appendix cancer? Uh, or, or are they different or are they same thing or what? Yeah, Sandy, thanks for your question. Um, so, an, a tum so any tumor that's found in the appendix would be considered an appendix cancer. Um, in this case, a net would be a subgroup. So you can have other types of appendiceal cancers, uh, but fortunately, neuroendocrine tumors tend to be the lowest uh, grade uh, and, and most indolent of all appendiceal cancers. Got it. Thank you for that. There's been a few questions I've seen about uh, about the, the appendix and, and nets being found there. So hopefully that helps serve uh, the rest of them as well. Um, we've got a few minutes left, folks, who continue to send in your questions. Dr. Doss, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about clinical trials. Um, I know you're involved, you know, you kind of set the, the, the stage for us at the beginning of the show and, and the ones that you've been involved with, the ones you are involved with. Are there any that you'd like to see in the future that you think that would really make make an impact, make progress that uh, that you think we could we could see in treatment and diagnosis? That's a fantastic question, Rand. I mean, so I think now as a field, we're becoming a lot more thoughtful about the studies we put forward, because ultimately, right, every trial, particularly in, in for patients, for example, that uh, have a diagnosis of an unremovable neuroendocrine tumor, should be directed to improving quantity of life or quality of life. And if we're not answering those questions, that's not the right trial. So what I'd love to see are more trials, and actually some of these are ongoing, asking questions about when do we sequence therapies. So um, there are two studies. One is called the COMPETE study, which is actually looking at Everolimus versus PRT in patients with somatostatin receptor positive gas, uh, GEP nets or gastroenteropancreatic nets. The other study that's really interesting that's ongoing is the Netter 2 study. So that's actually looking at patients with a little bit more biologically aggressive G2 and G3 GEP nets and looking at sandostatin high dose first line versus PRT first line. So that's really relevant because that's going to help us provide when should we be giving these treatments. But Ren, I would love to see studies where we compare some of, like for example, our tyrosine kinase inhibitors. You know, I think I think certain drugs like uh, lenvatinib and cabozantinib are soon going to get FDA approved. Um, you know, depending on results of some trials, but we're not going to know. You know, when those should be positioned compared to sunitinib for a patient with a pancreatic net. So I'd love to see more head-to-head -head studies. Um, and you know, and and very, and I think we as investigators need to ask these questions because you know we need to look beyond just efficacy. For example, if two drugs are equally effective. But one is less toxic. We need to, you know, pick that drug. So we need to become more innovative in looking at, even when drugs are similar, about looking at other endpoints. So I would love to look at things like toxicity, you know, financial burden, uh, burden for patients, whether it's coming into a cancer center for their treatments. So we need to look at other endpoints. So those are some of the other uh, types of trials that I'd love to see come, come to fruition. So glad I asked that question because sequences, sequencing is something that comes up every week mm -hmm. and obviously something that is definitely being debated yeah. and discussed is it maybe a better way to, to, to put it uh, currently. I mean, that's so I appreciate you saying that. Um, you mentioned quality of life and quantity of life, and I totally agree with your point about uh doctors being more thoughtful about this now and, and weighing in all these variables and not just mm -hmm. looking at it from a single lens, right? Mm -hmm. So let's flip it on the other side. What can a patient do? Let's say a first a first time patient, you know, new to this, mm -hmm. this disease, what can a patient do to try to protect that quality and quantity of life when they get this diagnosis, what's what's your advice to someone when they when they first get this diagnosis to to try to maintain and achieve that quality and quantity of life? Yeah. So again, another terrific question, Ryan. I think a few things. So if you can, I highly recommend everybody to see a net specialist. It's not that you have to necessarily even get treatment with that individual, but just the perspective that they provide. And and I the reason I say that is the the example that pops to my mind is. For some patients with metastatic disease, I just watch them because you don't need to start treatment. Quality is already fantastic. It's not being affected by the neuroendocrine tumor. The tumor isn't growing. And in, some, in many instances, for example, patients are put on treatments just because they have this tumor. 
Um, but again, that has impact. So I think the most important thing would be seeing a net specialist. The second thing I would say is get connected. You know, we are blessed through the CCF, uh, other, uh, we have tremendous patient advocacy groups, um, other patient information things like the NetRF, um, get connected with people, um, see how other patients' journeys have been, because I think um, you guys are the richest resources for, for one another. Um, and I think learning about, for example, how someone's patient journey 10 years down the road has been oftentimes gives a lot of perspective on perhaps the things you feel or need that you might need to do or might not need to do. So those are, I think, the two things that I could say um, up front. Absolutely. Uh, Plus one to both of those. Uh, definitely reach out to your community. And that's one of the things I'm most proud about with this show is we seem to be cultivating a, a great community here. And I love that. Jenny says, thanks for being here and answering our questions for us. Absolutely, Jenny. That's what we're here to do. AG says, thank you, Rain and Dr. Doss for answering my questions and taking such good care of our Tennessee support group members. Back to your point too, Dr. Doss, about, you know, just leaning on the community, people with a little more experience with this support groups are another way to do that. Dr. Das, Nanu, thank you, my friend. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Ryan. Again, it, it flew by, so it was, it was a lot it, of fun. It does, and, and like I told you, we have some really good questions that come across. We have a really great community here, and thank you as well to you, the community, friends of the foundation, for being here. We hope this program helped answer some of your questions, and again, I'll reiterate, if, if you have follow-up questions or questions we didn't get to, please reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, either here on their Facebook page, private message them, or at carcinoid.org, and they will get you the information you need or the information of the specialist that will. Uh, as always, thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therape Therapeutics. We wouldn't be able to do this program without you and your support. We appreciate you. Finally, my name is Ren Rain Bennett. Thanks for watching. I am your host. Please join us next time on Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.